happiness is, as I see it today, it's, it's a result, all right? And so, you know, I'm never just focusing on happiness, right? Happiness is like the cake, all right? But I'm focusing on the ingredients. So, you know, recognizing that like, all right, how am I with my gratitude this morning, all right? How am I with my patience this morning? How am I within my connections with my community this morning? And recognizing that, you know, when I'm able to find the right ingredients for, you know, the dish that I'm trying to make just for the day, all right? Um, is that that's where I'm able to find the happiness. Hey, y'all, welcome back to the Stacking Days podcast, where we highlight underrepresented journeys of sobriety from within the BIPOC community. I'm your host, Ray Donovan, and today we have Brandon joining us all the way from Nairobi, Kenya. So needless to say, we are in for a treat. <laughs> I imagine I imagine we're going to cover a lot uh, of subject matter today. Uh, I've you know been watching and observing Brandon from afar, and I'm sure we're going to get into everything from homelessness and rock bottoms to being a change agent and building platforms for good. So if you can't tell, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, so without further ado, let's get into it. Brandon, welcome to the show. And thank you so much for having me here. Thank you so much for uh, just celebrating my existence, man. That's uh, really an honor, an absolute honor to be of service. So yeah, thank you so much. You got it, man. Uh, let's get right into it. Um, I want to start, you know, kind of at the beginning, uh, if we if we could. You know, this show is all about, you know, uh, alcohol, sobriety, alcohol free and the journey and the pursuit of that. So I'd love to be able to go back to your origin and where your relationship with alcohol started. And we can kind of just take it chronologically from there to the point where you moved on to, uh, to you know, certainly greener pastures. Hey, okay, yeah, I, I think that's a great way to get started. So, you know, when I, I'm sort of looking at my origin story, I'm, I'm going to utilize sort of there's like a, an epilogue right um for my drinking right and, and it's not to create this canvas of like oh woe is me but to allow ourselves to understand some of the conditioning that we might have experienced without even recognizing it right so my initial connection with uh, alcohol actually started from you know my grandmother's household i was raised by my grandma for you know first couple of years of my life right um and my first ever chore in that household was to take out the beer cans while the guys in our family drank during the Redskin games, right? We're in Washington, DC. Right. So, you know, genuinely, like it, it became this little sort of funny game that they would leave, I mean, the smallest of smidgens for me, right? Obviously I'm not getting drunk. I'm like five, six years old, right? But, right, when, when I'm starting to think about my first conditioning is, you know, the first time I actually saw this and connected with it, it was at a really young age, right? It was me watching, you know, right. uh, you know, my grandparents, my uncles, my cousins, right, sit around and drinking and say, like, hey, you could even be a part of this, right? Um, and so, you know, that was like mm -hmm. probably my first understanding, right? Like, let's say Easter egg, right? Um, but then, yep. you know, I really didn't come back around it. Um, until I was, you know, around 18 years old, right? Um, I, I spent a real short stint in college. Um, I was at University of Pittsburgh, and that was the next time I was introduced to this as like, hey, this is how you consume it. You use this to black out, um, and you never have to worry about anything else, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I took that, uh, as I said, it was a really short stay in college. And next thing you know, I was um, back in Atlanta, right? Which is where I spent a lot of my formative years, right? Um, and at the time I was in Southwest Atlanta off a of prior road, um, which for people who know anything about Atlanta, that is a, uh, <laughs> it's a wild part of Atlanta for sure. Um, and, you know, at the time, you know, we were- <laughs> Did you just, did you just- did you just find yourself there or how did how did you end up in that area of, of uh, Atlanta no, not being from there? You know, uh, to be a, a hundred percent honest, you know, part of my story is, um, you know, the family that I was raised by, we are the last slaves in America. Right. My grandmother ran off of uh, a cotton field at 19 years old. Right. In South Carolina. Damn. So, you know, the uh, uh, ecosystem. Right. That I grew up in. Uh, it, it was. It created a different rhythm, right? It created a language that uh, is only spoken in certain parts of America, right? So um, although I traveled mm -hmm. everywhere, I always found myself in a very similar 
neighborhood as I, I grew up in, right? So, you know, for me, being in Southwest Atlanta was no different than Southeast DC, was no different than East New York, you know, like I've lived in all these places. So, you know, at the time I was in Southwest Atlanta, um, you know, there's eight of us in a three bedroom, no hot water, no electricity. Um, and, you know, we're just surviving. Um, and, you know, during that time, that's when I started to create my own connection with alcohol, right? Before this, it was a lot of people sort of giving me their perspectives. Um, and it was around that time that I started being like, all right, this is going to be, you know, my tool. Um, and, you know, from there, it just started to grow in different ways. And yeah, I just you know, kept on experiencing it. I'm not sure if you want me to give you the whole story right now or just sort of the introduction. How, how would you like me to, yeah, feel? No, I mean, let's, 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 let's get into it. I mean, what, what did your, uh, conversation look like when you started to make alcohol your own and you know and what was it doing for you at that point in your life that maybe it wasn't doing for you when you were in you know in Pittsburgh or or you know before then okay yeah I, that's great so yeah when I started recognizing that I could have my own conversation with the alcohol um, it, it would genuinely start off from you know the concept of waking up in these mornings and I mean like honestly man living off you know, prior road and that moments and a lot of chaos is going on, break-ins every day, police checkpoints, you know, the whole nine. Um, you know, you start recognizing, man, you have limited resources and you have a, a great need to escape, right? Um, and so you know, I started, yeah, understanding, you know, in that season, right? Like, okay, I could go to this store for like $2.25, you know, get a 40 ounce, um, and you know, with two of these, right, like it doesn't even feel like we don't have hot water, right? Like I don't even have to worry about taking a shower. Today, yep. Right. Um, or, you know, even with this, like, oh, give me the courage to say like, Hey, man, we're just gonna light candles around this house, you know, or just like, just create this space that didn't feel as, uh, maybe raw. Right. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, that that's sort of what started it. Um, and, you know, to be honest and sort of just like propel us a little bit more forward in the story. I was actually at that time I was uh, growing as a musician. All right. Um, OK. And, you know, so through this story, I'm, I'm utilizing the tough times to sort of drink through it. And I'm focusing on the music um, and not recognizing that by escaping the emotions during the day, I'm recording it at night, right? Um, and so what happens yep. is, is you know, like, because, uh, you know, the music business is business like everything else. You put in enough effort, you'll get to where you, you know, seek, right? So, you know, next thing you know, I'm finding myself, you know, with uh, pretty popular music. Um, you know, we're touring, we're doing big shows um, and finding out that the way that I am expressing this anger through this music is the only thing that is connecting all right um but that's mm. but understanding in that moment that i know i'm much more than the way that i'm expressing myself right um and so you know right. really when things sort of let's just say like boiled over right um i put all my eggs in this music basket my music was coming from a place that i didn't feel really represented who i was we end off on mm -hmm. a tour and I'm like looking back at sort of this chaos that we created during this tour. Um, and I'm like, all right, I can't do this anymore. So I step away from music. Mm -hmm. I have no background, never had a job or anything and didn't believe that I had another identity that I could find in myself. Um, and that's when, you know, my drinking mm -hmm. really started to spiral. Right. Um, and so from like 25 through 29, it just became that space. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you've kind of gotten to this impasse in your life where you feel completely lost and, you know, without any direction, you almost started to drown yourself, so to speak, in, in the alcohol. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's through the lens of, you know, I told myself, I mean, I started working on music at my first like record deal at 13 years old. Right. Um, so, you know, now I'm 25, mm -hmm. making it to what I consider is like you know, at the precipice, right, of stardom um, and recognizing like, oh, I don't want to do it like this at all. Um, and I think, right, that uh, there's no option for me to do this unless it's this pathway. And, you know, this doesn't feel right. Um, and so, yeah, in that moment, it was just spiraling out and being like, all right, I don't know if the universe has a place for me. 
right? Um, and really mm. allow myself to be stuck in this uh, projection or this concept that the only value that I have on this planet is just by making music, which is no longer, you know, feeding me, right? Um, and so for there, like yeah. from there, it became like, yeah, a four year, like genuine struggle. Like I had already been, you know, utilizing it for different ways, but after that it became four years of, you know, me just, uh, yeah, just sort of trying to escape in every way possible. Mm. I, you know, one of the things that I, that I have, recognize and just kind of watching you and, and just in preparing for our conversation is that you're a very introspective individual, right? Um, and, and I find that it's unique that you, even in kind of the, the grips of, you know, the alcohol, you still had an extreme amount of introspection around, you know, where and how you showed up in, you know, this experience of, of, of life. And I can imagine that, you know, while that can serve one, you know, very, very well, if you are in a position where you're coming from a place of pain, that type of recognition can only be probably more demoralizing than, than, than motivating. So it makes sense mm -hmm. to me that you're trying to escape this, 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 uh, this kind of self critique and this realization that, you know, where am I going to be able to show up in this space? I know that I'm meant for something, but I cannot see the path for the love of life of me into how I'm going to get there. And, and you know what's uh, I, what I really appreciate, and I'm going to just reiterate in sort of just different language here is allowing. You know, for me, it was a really big thing because I was learning to express myself, and I was surrounded by a community that also felt that this was. Uh, an acceptable and a celebrated way of representation, right? But recognizing th right. that art is open to interpretation, right? So I, like, we're making this music and we're all this angry, right? So we all feel as if it's okay. Yep. But then once it's you know taken from the neighborhood and put on a national stage and recognize like, oh, they don't receive it like this. They're not hearing this as somebody who doesn't have hot water and electricity. They're just hearing this as somebody who's angry as hell right and they're just connecting from that lens um yeah. and then you know within there yeah. having that yeah really reflection and being just hyper aware of like okay they're not going to receive me in the way that i'm trying to speak if, if i'm doing it just from this standpoint um and so from there you know i i gave myself the grace to step away but didn't recognize how much of a uh whirlpool i would find myself in uh, just for, you know, not yeah. recognizing that there are so many more identities I, I would be able to step into. Yeah. So let's, let's kind of move through the next four years. I'm, I'm assuming a portion of those four years are, is probably pretty blurry. Um, yeah. you know, you probably also have some pretty, you know, deep memories of those, of those four years that, you know, still have an impact on, on you to this day. You know, can you just give me a snap of, you know, what that time looked like for you? And then ultimately, most importantly, what was kind of like the final straw that broke the camel's back where you started moving into a, a, a new direction, either, you know, voluntarily or, you know, by way of, uh, you know, of happenstance? Great question. Great question. So, you know, at that time, um, let's say 25, there was right before this, there was this period of running away from myself, not recognizing you take you with you wherever, where you go, right? Or anywhere you go. Yeah. So, you know, first I left Atlanta, moved to New York for a bit, did the exact same thing in New York and then uh, moved to DC. So at 25, I'm in uh, Southeast <laughs> DC, right? On uh, Minnesota Avenue, which, you know, just another very, very wild corner uh, of America. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, genuinely, when I, when I look back at some of the things that I was experiencing, then it's, it wasn't even me, the entire ecosystem was, you know, suffering from an oppression that we were all trying to fight in different ways. Right. Uh, I mean, just to give sort of, uh, a, a viewpoint is for me to go get fruits and vegetables from Minnesota Ave in Washington, DC, inside Washington, DC, right. It would take me two buses and two trains, all right, to be able to go get fruits and vegetables from my neighborhood, right? So about an hour and a half trip, right? For me right. to even get to the first bus stop, I've already passed three liquor stores. 
Right. All right. So at the time, and our liquor stores on Minnesota Ave, they open up at 7 a.m., right? <laughs> right? Right. And so, people are, and people are there. Oh, it's packed. It's packed. It's packed at 7 a.m. So, you know, I was trying to escape myself for a bit when I moved to D.C., but, you know, the environment, it, it was it was it was turbulent. You know, it was it was just tough. Uh, and especially at the time, I, I hadn't really sat down with my thinking. What were you saying? No, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I, I've, I've spent a fair amount of time in D.C. I went to Howard University uh, for, a, for a stint. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when you talk about D.C. and Southeast, like I just I have pictures in my mind of the city at that time. I mean, and D.C. is a rough town. I mean, just, you know, it's it's just a rough town, you know, and, and a lot of callousness, a lot of pain in that city. And it, it certainly feels dark. You know, so when you paint that picture of, you know, the liquor stores opening at 7 a.m., I can see those liquor stores and I can see the people outside of those stores at 7 a.m. Um, you know, it's it's uh, so it was just bringing back yeah. some memories for me. That's I all. Mean, I mean, it, it's, it's wild when you when you really recognize that, you know, D.C., you cross over the Potomac River uh, into southeast and it's a whole different world. Right. Um, and so, yeah. you know, just the way that uh, in that moment I was, you know, watching people survive, you know, they were just reiterating some of the habits that we had all learned, right? Um, probably from similar scenarios as, you know, myself, right? Uh, just watching others, you know, trying to escape and really heal, right, um, through these moments. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I spent the next couple of years burning every bridge that um, I, I was able to build. Um, and, you know, it just sort of culminated in, uh, yeah, me ended up being homeless for about nine months. All right. Um, and at that time, yeah, I was either sleeping, you know, off of Minnesota Ave and Benning Road, or I would uh, go up to uh, U Street by the uh, Bus Boys and Poets. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, you know, I, I was drinking this uh, gin. It was called it's called Fleischmann's. It's probably still available, right? And you can get a fifth of this, right, for uh, six ninety nine, right? Uh, so I, I was focused on having, you know three fifths a day. So I would have three bottles for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, so, you know, my main goal was about 25 bucks a day. So it'd be three of those bottles and two double cheeseburgers uh, from McDonald's, which was obviously right down the street as well. Um, and so, yeah, yeah that right, was, up, right on the corner of 14th and you. You know it. Right there, right? Um, no, okay. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> just uh, that was sort of my routine um, for a while. And uh, then it was a, a random Tuesday. I had, uh, hadn't showered probably in, I don't know, a little bit over two weeks at that time. All right. I know it's definitely past 10 days. Um, and my sort of uh, my routine would be to drink a bottle early in the morning and then just try and ride the buses and trains all day. You have a turnstile or you just sort of slide on and you just sort of have free accommodations for the day. Um, so I've fallen asleep on the back of a bus and uh, one of the older women uh, who was on that bus, she just saw the state that I was in and she was like, I think this young man is about to die. Um, and so she called the ambulance for me. Right. Um, and, you know, next thing you know, I woke up in the hospital with a 0.52, all right, um, you know, blood alcohol content. So, I mean, I think that means like 52% of your blood is alcohol at that point in time. And, I mean, for me, it was just a regular Tuesday. You know, I think it was like 1.15 or 1.30 on a Tuesday this happened. Um, but, yeah, that was sort of the state that I was in. But uh, from there, it was interesting is that I... Uh, you know, it was the first time that I had to just start being open, you know, talk with, you know, my mother about this, um, talk with my grandmother about this, just let people know, you know, how much I was hurting. Um, and from there, it started its own journey of finding, you know, new ways to heal where I didn't have to do it alone. Yeah, man, uh, Brandon, that's a, that's that's uh, a lot. You know, anytime I hear these sto stories of, you know, when folks kind of you know, literally are just kind of crashing and burning and dying. Um, and then what it takes to kind of come back to life. You know, whenever I hear uh, these stories, it, it, it makes me think of, you know, the, you know, these, the phoenix rising from, from the ashes, right? I mean, you're pretty much burnt out, uh, you know, on your deathbed, uh, either, you know, literally or figuratively. 
and and what it takes to kind of you know move the momentum in the opposite direction right is is enormous you i i listened to a piece that you append where you were um kind of comparing the concept of transparency and um and um invisibility I think it was yeah. right and if you could in a in a kind of quick synopsis you know give the listeners a sense of that transition from you for you going from invisibility into a world of transparency because it sounds about a, a lot of that's where you had to start moving towards to reconcile some of those relationships you know with the folks who cared about you but more importantly the relationship with yourself yeah and you know i'm so glad that you uh, brought up uh that piece um transparency man um and yeah, I, I think it's yeah, it's definitely apt for this moment. So you know, as that time I was drinking, um, I really I was trying to be you know uh, you know Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, right? It's a, it's a fantastic book from back in the day, um, and really just hiding uh, into the you know the shadows of life, and like genuinely like I mean I wasn't responding to text messages, anything. I was living my whole own life in this moment. And I just wanted to be hidden away from, you know, the the light of the world. All right. Um, and then, you know, on that day when, you know, that happened and, and it was a little bit further than that. So when I woke up in the hospital, I'm half of my family, last slaves in America, other half first freed uh, slave civilization. All right. Uh, and that's St. Kitts. Right. Tiniest island. So nobody talks about it, but it is still part of our history. Right. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, other half is from St. Kitts. Right. Uh, the population right now is probably less than 30,000. So I wake up in D.C. and the nurse who is talking to me is from St. Kitts. All right. Uh, I had just lost my grandfather that year, which was, you know, obviously, you know, or not obviously, but uh, was just genuinely, you know, part of, you know, my tension that I was experiencing. And so to wake up and hear this accent that is really distinct, um, I'm like, what? And, you know, she's asking me these questions. She's like, I just don't get it. She's like, why, why would you give up right now? She's like, look at you. She's like, you're a, a, a handsome, able young man. You look extremely intelligent. And she's like, and you just decided to give up? She's like, I, I, just, I just can't get this. Um, and, you know, as I'm hearing, you know, that dialogue, obviously in that moment for me, it, it felt like, you know, my grandfather speaking to me. And, yeah, I, I had to sit within this truth, you know, uh, that, you know, no matter what I was doing, I was waking up every single day, right? No matter how much I didn't want to wake up at night through my practices, you know, the universe is waking me up every day. And so, you know, I had to start asking myself, you know, not only like, you know, or stop asking myself, what does this moment mean to me, right? But what do I mean to this moment, right? So, you know, why is this universe waking me up every day? Why is this universe giving me this story? Why is it giving me this capacity and capability? Um, and from there, I, I started, you know, the idea of like, all right, I'm not going to be invisible. I'm going to be transparent, right? So everything that I'm experiencing, y'all are going to experience it with me, right? I am not perfect. I am just person. Right. Um, and that really just became, you know, uh, yeah, sort of the, the guidelines uh, for the next couple of years. Man, I, uh, I love that. And I appreciate, you know, you kind of laying that out. I think that's incredibly uh, it's incredibly powerful kind of you know, perspective to take on on one's own um, embarkment and healing um, for sure. Talk to me about about what those early days of sobriety look like for you. I mean, you you're in the hospital. I'm a, you, you're sitting here today, so I'm assuming you left the hospital at some point. <laughs> what did it look like for, for you to reintegrate, uh, to, you know, or to just integrate into the world as you know someone who now had to feel everything in a very real way? That's not a great question. Um... I mean, honestly, the the first couple of days was so much flooding back to reality um, that it, it's it's tough to even put a perfect word to it, right? It, it just feels like you know. I, I think the analogy I can use is just you're in a whirlpool a whirlpool of reality, right? Uh, of just being you know the first time like during my drinking there was a phase where I hadn't looked in the mirror in like six months. All right. 
because I knew I looked like death, right? My eyes were so sunken that I was terrified to look in the mirror. Um, and so to have, you know, doctors, family, people be around you and be like, yo, do you see you right now? Right? Like, and, and finally having to take that look, it was, it was a, a real experience. And, you know, genuinely, um, I, I was blessed enough in these mo or in that moment or in, in that season to be able to already start recognizing, like, look, if I'm going to do this, I am going to, if I'm going to find this transparency, I'm going to need to do it in a place where I can shine the best. Um, and so I was lucky enough to where I had a friend to a friend who put me in touch with a farm in South Georgia. Um, it's called Zenith Land Farm, Perry, Georgia. That's the name of the city in Perry, Georgia. Uh, and I moved to a pecan farm, which was supposed to be for three months. And I stayed for like seven um, and I stayed and worked on a pecan farm, picking up sticks, right, um, every single day. 5,000 acre pecan farm. My entire job, pick up sticks for nine, 10 hours a day. Um, and uh, that was really where I, I gave myself the space to finally start thinking. I mean, that's all you got. All you got is time, right? Just you picking up sticks. All you got is time to think. And um, I allowed myself to really start working from there, start trying to get aligned with my passions that were just in that season with impatience. Um, and, and from there, I, I started just allowing myself to grow. You know, it's, it's interesting. You, you, when you start talking to people in recovery, if you want, you know, or in healing from, you know, substances and from traumas and all of these things that we're, you know, we're trying to, to better ourselves from, I like to say, at least on this podcast that I'm just kind of like, program agnostic i don't really care how people go about pursuing their sobriety you know what i mean so long as they can do it some folks do 12 steps some people pick up sticks on pecan farms right it's like whatever whatever works for you to, to get to a place where you could do some of that inner work and silence your silence the surroundings so that you can do that 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 inner work i think is fantastic and maybe you didn't even necessarily know what you were getting into in you know heading down to georgia to work on this farm but I, it sounds like once you got hold of it you recognized this is where you needed to be in order to continue to grow exactly and you know one thing i i recognize and the analogy i think i'm going to use for this moment is you know let's think of ourselves as a house all right um and you know this yeah i'm, I'm just going to use the analogy where the exterior of a house right and so, you know, for years, I've allowed myself to sort of fall apart, right? Like the shades are coming off and all these things. Um, and so I recognized, like in that moment, like, okay, this season is going to be about the rebuild, right? But here's the good thing about this, is that if I sit down and I make this rebuild my entire focus, right? I don't focus on what it's going to look like when it's done. I don't focus on what, you know, the people I'm going to invite over after it's beautiful. But if I just focus on this rebuild, right, that I might only have to do it in this manner one time in my life. All right. Um, and so, you know, I, I jumped into staying on the farm for months. After that, I went and lived in a halfway house for six months. Right. Just to when I went back to Atlanta, I was like, all right, if I'm going to reintegrate, I'm going to do it while I have a huge safety net through this halfway house, even if it's me and five 50 year old white dudes living together. Right. Uh, I'm just going to create this. And, you know, I gave myself like, yeah, about like a year and a half um, of, of time of just being like, nah, just focus on this um, and then figure out what it's like to take, a, you know, a deep breath after this, you know, uh, intense practice like this submersion. Mm, I love that. A, you know, just kind of really being in the moment of, and in the season that, that is calling you. I think that's great. I, I mean, I, 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 when you say that, I think of, you know, the, the moments on the season that I'm in in my life right now mm. and the build that I'm trying to build right now. And I, and I hear you in that you kind of want to do it right, you know, so you, so you don't have to revisit it, you know, in, uh, you know, in a few months from now, in a few years from now, like if you can get that, that foundation, that exterior, you know, secure then you know you have something to kind of work with moving forward yeah and you know honestly like and and the, and the reason why i'm just gonna like interject here is that it's not that i'm focusing on right or wrong right 
it's that I'm focusing on the depth of intelligence, right? And so understanding that when I was drinking, right, I gained an entire new intelligence in drinking, right? In being homeless, I gained an entire new intelligence. I could tell you how to get free meals for a month straight in Washington, D.C., right? I can tell you every single liquor store that's open at 7 a.m. I can tell you how to get there off the train station, right? I learned a certain intelligence. And so recognizing in this rebuild, I need to learn the intelligence of me, right? Of, you know, all of these, you know, cracks and crevices, right? I need to like allow myself to start studying like, hey man, where are you softest, right? Where is your strength, right? Where are you hurting? Um, and allowing it that like, I don't have to do this right, but I have to give it the space. I have to give it the right time, right? It deserves its own season. Um, and so just allowing myself to really delve into that and be like, how intelligent can I become about my story? Right. How much intelligence can I have about my perspective and the conditioning of it? Right. Um, and the creativity that I can garner from uh, like reclaiming it. Uh, and, and that really became mm -hmm. sort of the main focus for that year and a half time. And obviously today as well, it's a, it's a daily practice. Well, let me ask you. So, I mean, I don't want to fast forward too much, but, you know, for someone who is not accustomed to going deep into one's self, how do you how how did you go about pursuing that that exercise in saying, OK, I need to really go deep here as opposed to trying to go wide because there are some roots here that I that that I need to uncover and I need to understand, you know, what they're tethered to below. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, what, what what did you do to kind of go to that degree of depth and have the attention, quite frankly, to get in there uh, and get into the wound to be able to deal with it? Yeah. And, and, you know, one thing I, I think is so beautiful is, you know, uh, as I was on that farm, you know, I, I've heard this phrase and I think we probably all have is like, you're the sum of the five closest people next to you. Right. And so, you know, at the time I'm only surrounded by trees and sticks. Right. So I get to choose who my company is. Right. So, you know, I start downloading every single book that I feel is going to be helpful you know, whether it's, you know, autobiographies, whether it's self-help. And I start recognizing, like, I can choose every single day to be around the five most emotionally intelligent, the most emotionally available, the most spiritually inclined um, people in the world, right? And then I can make this my entire circle. Uh, and so within there, you know, by even just checking in with different stories from different timelines, um, you know, I think Soledad Brother by George Jackson, right? Incredible. It's a book that's banned from prisons today. And, you know, it's literally the story of him writing letters back to his family while he's on death row. Um, and when you're even taking in the dialogue of his anger towards his mother and his parents, then you start saying like, man, I have an anger like that, right? And like you're, you're viewing it and you're like, man, you see where this anger gets him. Like, I wonder if this anger is going to bring me in the same place. I wonder if there's any other perspective that could hold that I can hold on this anger. Because I, I see how we've been conditioned to respond to this anger. But like, what if I gave myself just one extra perspective on this? Right. Um, what if I gave myself more history? So like recognizing there was a time I spent so angry at a father, you know, who had, you know, an intense addiction not recognizing like this man spent his first four or five years on a slave field as well, right? My grandmother came from picking cotton, did not know what Thanksgiving was in America in the 1950s because of what slavery looked like in South Carolina. And then 20 years later, entered the crack epidemic in Washington, DC. Like nobody had a chance, right? So like I've been sitting here with this narrative that this man is selfish when I'm not recognizing this man is suffering, right? And so allowing myself to start working from this space of like, look, I understand some of the tools you utilize to get here. But if you want to get somewhere else, you're going to have to see if any other tools can work. Right. So let's just look at this journey. Let's, let's look at, you know, the steps we've taken and figure out, you know, if there's anything else we could utilize to keep going. Yeah, uh, that's that's. I love that. I mean, that's fantastic perspective. You know, when you when you start talking about, you know, opening up your 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 aperture and, you know, bringing in thoughts and messages from other, you know, individuals over the course of time, I think about the question that people often ask like, you know, if you had an opportunity to have dinner with, you know, three people, who would they be? You know what I mean? And it's like we live in a time 
where we don't have to even ask that question, right? Mm. We can we can tap into their knowledge because it's all available to us, right? It's it's not it doesn't have to be this aspiration. It can be very real, and and, and I love how you kind of laid that out and how that ultimately propelled you into a you know a journey of self knowledge. I think that that's important, and you know a lot of times you know. You know, we get into these addictions because there is just unknown that it's uncomfortable, right? So how do we how do we let you know some clarity and some context? And sometimes we have to go from outside to be able to do that. Whereas you know, with the alcohol, we're trying to just numb it from the inside. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think you know, as we're checking in with ourselves, you know, I had to recognize like I spent so many different versions of myself and inside of so many identities where you know a lot of these things were being reiterated just because of the environment that i was in but then allowing myself to look inside in that moment and be like okay well this is where that ecosystem got me right and i'm not villainizing it i'm celebrating it because it did teach me a ton but also recognizing that if i'm looking or seeking to explore anything else right that i'm, I'm gonna have to bring in a completely new perspective right and so really allowing myself to say like well, what if everything we learned in South Atlanta was a lie, right? <laughs> like, what if everybody just tricked us, right? And who could I surround myself now and talk to them, you know, just metaphorically, just by hearing their stories and being able to, you know, uh, sort of pinball their ideas, right? Who could give me a completely different perspective on what it meant to grow up in South Atlanta, right? Who could give me a completely different perspective on what it meant to be homeless? Um, and I think the more that we spend time inside these conversations, you know, at least just in my experience, like the softer the space that we can create, um, you know, the more that we can sift through it, right? The more that we, we feel empowered as we sift through it. Uh, and, and that's become, you know, one of the things that really helps propel, you know, who I am and what we do today is recognize like, oh man, no, all of this is like celebratory material, right? Like, it's like, let's keep on digging. And like, it's gonna give us more reason to celebrate tomorrow and like in this moment, you know? Yeah. Well, let me, let's talk about that. Let's talk about creating spaces. Um, you know, I know that, that it just in, in reading about your journey, part of your story is the creation of, of space, right? And, you know, whether that be online spaces or whether that be spaces of opportunity. So, it, w- I, so I, I don't, we don't need to spend a lot of time on this. It, it really is up to you. But in creating your recovery road space, right, and, and the online community, what purpose was that to serve? And ultimately, did it serve its its purpose, its intended purpose for you? And I love that question, man. Thank you so much. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's one of these times once again, right? And like what made Recovery Road so amazing is that like instead of being, you know, invisible man, I decided to be transparent man for the world, right? So, you know, in that moment, I actually, I just moved to New Orleans not too long ago. I had lost the first job I ever had. I was losing my apartment. The girl I was with also had just left back to Atlanta. Um, And so, you know, I was in this sort of panic, right? Um, Of, oh snap, I'm in the drinking capital of America now. Um, And I don't have any foundation, right? Of of gratitude, right? That I can hold on to. Um, And so, you know, what we did or what I did in that moment is Reddit had this uh forum or yeah this platform called rpan which is just like instagram live but you can your channel can go to the whole world if everybody likes it right so i I sat down i you know created you know a a page or like sort of a yeah a live and it was like i don't want to relapse for the next hour who wants to hang out um and this is you know as the pandemic's hitting and me not realizing at that time as i'm just speaking my truth that there's millions of people around the world who are like, fuck, man, I really needed to (laughs) address some of the ways I've been experiencing the pandemic. Um, And so that first episode, you know, we had 10,000 people, right? Um, And I had no clue what I was going to do with it. But, you know, of the 10,000 people, I mean, we had like a thousand comments um, that was like, man, if you came back tomorrow, I would be here. Like, I'd be here every day. And it started off with them just asking, in you know asking for my transparency of like how did you survive being homeless how did you get food what happened when you lost your glasses right and i was so for the first week i was genuinely just describing like this is the intelligence i learned being homeless this is the intelligence i learned from alcohol uh and 
in that moment, I all of a sudden started seeing all these responses, right? And now I'm actually, I just saw this, like there's a book by Howard Gardner called Multiple Intelligences that like fleshes this out in a much uh, more fluid way. But in this moment, right, uh, because, you know, second day we have 20,000, by the end of the week, we're having 60,000 people a day, right? Um, and they're constantly re reiterating, I never knew that you could think like this about that type of experience, right? And all I'm doing in these moments is I'm relaying the information that my grandmother taught me, right? I'm relaying the information that I watched, you know, my mother experience, right? And this brand new world is telling me, yo, I've never, I've been to therapy for years, never had this thought before. I've done this for years, never realized you can think of it like this. Um, and, you know, it, it, it sparked something. I'm like, wait, I've created my own, or like, this is wisdom, right? Like I, through my experiences and through my stories, I have gone to my own university, right? Um, and I do have like a genuine perspective to be able to talk about this. And so, you know, from there, I think after like day six, I like did create like, all right, we're gonna do this for a year. I have no clue what it's gonna turn into, but I do believe that like the universe is, you know, not what does this mean to me, but right, uh, you know, what do I mean to this, right? So, right, if the universe has conspired in this way to put 60,000 people in front of me to say this, then I'm going to be of service to the universe and say that it probably knows a little bit more than me in this moment. Um, and so I didn't have a job. I started treating it just like a nine to five. I put in nine hours every single day on our product for the next morning. Um, and, you know, next thing you know, it became, you know, one of the most popular health and wellness shows in the world, you know. Um, and, you know, from there, you know, ended up having therapy companies and famous people reach out and be like, yo, you're a therapist and you just didn't know it. And next thing you know, they're giving me courses and accreditations. And, you know, now it's you know, a full time gig, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I, I literally mm. get paid to do what I used to do for free, which people told me growing up, like that was the goal. Right. So, <laughs> all right. They always say, do what you love and, it, and it's never a job. And I, I literally, I created my own job. Right. And, uh, so, you know, it's, it's a blessing to be able to experience that. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. I, you know, we, we got some, so a little bit more time here. I want to get into uh, Santana's foundation and how you transitioned from living in this, uh, in this virtual world to very much living in an analog world that you live in today, um, you know, creating equity a, in, in the communities that you're working with. And so can you tell us a little bit about that and how that kind of, what's the through line back to your recovery and why you're doing a lot of the work that you're doing today? Yeah, and you know, genuinely, this is another, just one of those moments of, of like, what do I mean to this moment? So, you know, we had hit this point maybe 30 days in um, where, you know, the show wasn't making any money yet because I hadn't figured out that, you know, focus um, and I did not have any cash to be able to stay in uh, New Orleans. And so I just started asking the people watching the show, right? This is the budget I have. I have 500 US dollars um, and I think I need another three months to be able to really focus on this show. Um, and I, I said specifically, I want to go in a place where, you know, black people are welcomed and celebrated. Uh, and then somebody literally sent a message they're like hey you know in oaxaca city mexico we pray to a guy who looks like you right and at the time i had an afro and i'm like what are you talking about and they send me the whole story templo de uh templo de santo domingo right in the center of the city and there is saint martin a brother with a huge afro and there is all these afro descendants that i didn't even know southern mexico had right but all these spanish people who identify as afro descendants and you know they're celebrating this and um so you know it, it started off with me going down to oaxaca having no clue we were going to be doing anything outside of just recovery road i get hit by a car my first week break my collarbone break everything and you know everyone's like yo you could probably give up right now um but I recognize, like, if I keep on going, because I'm talking this happiness thing, right? If I show up tomorrow full of gratitude with a broken collarbone and all this, like, the universe is going to pay off. Like, people are going to re recognize, like, this isn't, this isn't just talk, right? 
Um, and in that moment, right, we also recognize how expensive, cause like I didn't have the money to pay for a hospital. So my neighbor had to literally help me out with some water cause I couldn't afford water at the time. Um, and it gave us an insight to how expensive water is not just for me, but for everybody in this part of the city I was living. Um, and it turned into, you know, my neighbor giving me water to the whole, you know, uh, group on recovery road who was watching this, being able to provide free water for the city. Um, and then from there, next thing you know, people from all over the world were like, hey, man, can you come to our city and, you know, provide, you know, some service? And, uh, you know, that was about three and a half, four years ago. It actually is more than four years ago. Um, and yeah, now I'm, I'm doing the exact same thing. Was invited to be of service in Nairobi, Kenya. We have a community kitchen here taking care of about 200 kids. Um, and from there, the universe is starting to blossom in all these new ways. We have a reading program going. We're bringing in an art program. And uh, yeah, I'm just being of service, right? Man, I, you know, I, I, every once in a while, you know, I have conversations where you can quite literally see the ripple um, effects of, of one's healing. And, you know, yours clearly are far reaching. Uh, and I just, I think it's just a <laughs> It's just such a great, a great story, which is by no means, you know, over, right? There's so many more chapters that I feel like uh, to be written at this point. But, you know, hats off to you in, in pursuing the moments that were calling you um, without necessarily even knowing in the moment what it was calling for. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I think that's one thing I just am constantly inviting us to, right? Is that like even us waking up in this morning, that was not just our determination, right? We woke up this morning in collaboration, right? The universe yep. is inspiring to say like, nah, man, I got to see Ray this morning. Excited about the way that I could show up as Ray this morning, right? The universe shows up yep. through each and every one of us. And so, you know, each morning when we you know, are blessed enough to wake up, ask like, man, what is the universe trying to do through me today? Um, and allow ourselves to just be in collaboration. You know, incredible how much celebration you find, you know, through that path. No, totally, totally. I, I had a quick, quick, quick question. Mm -hmm. I have a few more questions as we kind of like, you know, end our conversation. But one is where did uh, your nickname, Brandon Be Happy, come from? I, I, we've, I, I think anyone who's spent any time watching me, we've heard the laugh, right? <laughs> but where does Brandon... Where does Brandon Be Happy come from? I, you know, so it, like uh, my Nick, I've had nicknames growing up. It was either Happy, it was Smiley, it was always my nickname. And then um, as I was just allowing myself to sort of get on this pathway, uh, it's not, and it's tough to understand it, but it's Brandon Be Happy, right? It's not that Brandon uh -huh. just be happy all the time. It's, yo, Brandon, be happy. Got you. Um, and so really, you. It's, it's a little bit more of a, an a, an invitation, right, to the gratitude, right, gotcha. to the reflection, like, yeah, I could be happy right now. Got you. Well, that makes that makes sense for sure. And and in that, I have a question. So you've obviously, you know, in your work, in your travels, you've you've had a pretty healthy sample size of the human condition. So I'm curious, at this point in your life, what does happiness mean to you? That is a great question. All right. And so, you know, happiness is, as I see it today, it's, it's a result, all right? And so, you know, I'm never just focusing on happiness, right? Happiness is like the cake, all right? But I'm focusing on the ingredients. So, you know, recognizing that like, all right, how am I with my gratitude this morning, all right? How am I with my patience this morning? How am I within my connections with my community this morning? And recognizing that, you know, when I'm able to find the right ingredients for, you know, the dish that I'm trying to make just for the day, right, um, is that that's where I'm able to find the happiness. And so, you know, allowing ourselves to recognize it's, it's not something that we, we want to be contained by or constrained by, right? It is something that as we are adding in all of these different spices and flavors in life that we just get to experience, right? Um, and so, yeah, happiness is, is a final result of some, uh, great processes and stuff. Nice. I love that. Uh, two last questions for you, uh, Brandon, and we'll, we'll, we'll close out here. One, and you know, with understanding that the audience, potentially someone is sitting out there and they're saying to themselves, there's, you know, in a self-evaluation, you know, maybe I have an issue that I need to address here. 
maybe there's some pain that I need to address. Maybe I need to address this alcohol. Uh, it's not serving me anymore. But I don't necessarily even know what my first step is going to be um, in this discovery and healing process. What would you say to that person? I think I would say to that person is that you're already inside of the step. All right. I, I think that awareness is the first step. All right. And then allowing ourselves from that state of awareness, right, to sort of break down the barriers, right, that have sort of contained us maybe in, you know, this season that we are now aware that we are ready to transition out of, right? And so right now, if we've been drinking, if we've been screaming, if we've been any of these things, right, and we're saying, hey, I'm ready for transition, right? And then just sort of allowing ourselves to say like, okay, if I'm already aware of it, what are the things that hold me to this, right? What are some of the reasons why I am comfortable with doing this? And what are some of the things outside of it that I would just like to experience, all right? Uh, and then start to say like, yeah, well, right now, this is my tool for anxiety. Well, it sounds like what I'm asking myself in this moment is I would like to change the way I deal with anxiety, all right? And so like, am I willing to break down the barrier of, yeah, there's only one way to deal with anxiety is screaming. It's this. No, right? How about I give myself just the faith, right? That this thought isn't even mine, right? This thought, the universe is in collaboration to give me this idea to allow me to be aware, right? That there is possibly another version of me who is available. And am I willing enough to just surrender to that, right? And say like, yeah, I, I think I could just try this out in another way. Yeah. Openness, surrender, being vulnerable and honest with yourself. I mean, that's all all, all of the things that I'm hearing. And I, I appreciate that perspective. Last question I have. And, you know, I, and I and I preface this question by saying, you know, in communities of color, you know, our mental health are, you know, is often not a focus. Right. And, you know, sometimes can be the ultimate detriment, you know, to us as individuals and perhaps even more broadly speaking as 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 pe as a people. My question for you is in some of your darkest days when you were really going through that kind of internal uh, tussle and, and struggle with identity and medicating that with alcohol, how would someone from the outside have known that you were struggling without you explicitly telling them so? Oh, that's a great question. And, you know, just to be 100% honest, as, uh, we can do our best to try and understand each other. But in reality, you know, this is it's a personal journey, all right? And so what looks like drowning to me might look like swimming to you, all right? And, and so um, I'm always inviting us to come back to our understanding of this before we try and push our understanding on another. Um, hmm. Yeah, so I, I think I, I invite that. True. Awesome. Well, Brandon, look, we're going to close this out. I want to make sure that folks can can find you, potentially even support the work that you're doing at Santana's Foundation. Uh, could you leave, you know, the audience with a, a few kind of data points that they can use to come back to to Brandon and, and the work that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I mean, feel more than welcome to, you know, just find us on social media. All right, me personally at Brandon B E Happy. All right, all one word. Uh, you can find the nonprofit at Santana's Fund, F-U-N-D, Santana's like Carlos Santana, right? Um, <laughs> or you can always check out the website, santanasfoundation.org. Um, and yeah, I think also if you're just looking for this space and one of the things that I would like to leave us with is, you know, we are, you know, the neighborhood nonprofit, right? Um, and I am maybe one of the most regular humans you've ever met in your life. Uh, so, you know, in a lot of ways, I, I would love for your support, but uh, also taking the time to just use this as a mirror to celebrate yourself, right? Um, what I'm doing, any and every single person who is listening to this can do, um, is just allowing ourselves to sort of surrender, right, once again, and allow that reality that maybe how I see myself isn't big enough to do this. But lucky enough, like I'm in collaboration with the universe who's deciding to wake me up. Right. And maybe the universe is big enough um, to allow me to accomplish some of these, you know, uh, intuitions, these whisperings that it keeps on giving me. So, uh, yeah, thanks a ton, Ray. I, I really appreciate the time and man, support everything that you're doing. 
you, you got it, man. And, and, and vice versa. I, I was saying before our show that I'm going to be in Nairobi in, uh, in about a month from now. And I definitely want to get some time with Brandon and, you know, and get an opportunity to get out into the community and, and, you know, lend some support with my own hands. So let's make sure that we stay in contact on that, you know, post, uh, post the interview, Brandon, uh, have a great rest of the day, man. And, uh, I'm, we'll be, we'll be in contact shortly about, you know, our next steps. Cause I think the collaboration is just beginning. Incredible, man. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, man, we are talking to you real soon. I appreciate you guys listening to the Stacking Days podcast. I hope this episode added value to your recovery and wellness journey. Before we go our separate ways, let's connect on social. You can find us on TikTok and Instagram at Stacking Days or via the website www.stackingdays.com. By supporting the show, you can play a direct role in amplifying people of color in their pursuit of recovery. The easiest way to do that is to subscribe or hit the follow button. This way you'll never miss an episode all while playing an active part in creating the ecosystem where diverse voices and healing matter. This show is for the purpose of education and connection and is not a replacement for therapy or recovery care. For more information on the resources and support available, take a look at SAMHSA and some other resources shared in the description. Until we meet again, be well, one day at a time.